Hi, I'm Zoo. And I'm Valerie. And this today is episode two of The Richmond Character. Today we are joined by a special guest. Would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Jay Plunky Branch from Richmond, Virginia. Okay, so Plunky has been uh, with doing this music thing for about 50 years. Is it 50 years? Just about 50 years. Just about 50 years. You, you're uh, quite versatile with your instruments. You have saxophone, uh, piano, is it? A little bit of keyboards, Keyboard. a little bit of bass, percussion, and vocals, but mostly Great. the saxophones. Your saxophones. And I want to start off by asking you about your beginnings in music. Like, how did you start off? Um, I started playing music in my house, playing, taking piano lessons when I was about six or seven years old. Um, formerly, I started in Richmond Public Schools in the fourth and fifth grade. Um, I joined the band playing the clarinet. Um, from there in school, and um, I played a number of instruments, uh, the clarinet, and by high school I also played timpani drums and oboe and bassoon. Um, I didn't start playing the saxophone until after I left high school. Um, I was in an R&B situation here in Richmond. That was the, the music that I heard most. Um, in my house, there was some jazz music. My father joined the Columbia Tape Club. You wouldn't know anything about that, but you, you could, for a few cents, get a, a new tape every month. And after he ordered the tapes that he wanted, he let, over the few months, let me order. And I ordered some Miles Davis and John Coltrane and Jimmy Smith and got familiar with, with jazz music. But that was my beginning uh, in, in my house and in the public schools. Right. So you mentioned you started off with R&B or listening to R&B. Um, what would you say was your transition from R&B to uh, jazz? Like, did you listen to mostly R&B and then transition to jazz? Yeah, more or less. I, I listened uh, to R&B because that was what's on the radio, the local radio. Some gospel music because I was going to church and th that was my, between gospel and R&B. When I went to college, um, I went to college at Columbia University in New York. And New York City is a great city for music in general, but particularly jazz music. Um, so at Columbia, I, um, my roommate um, was, uh, had a, his father had a tremendous jazz collection. Uh, he lived in Brooklyn, um, Columbia University is in Manhattan. But on weekends, we would go home to his house and just immerse ourselves in jazz music. Um, he started... Uh, a jazz radio show at Columbia. Their station was WKCR, and it's still renowned for the jazz uh, music programming that they do, but he started that. His name was Ken Parker at the time. Um, when I was at Columbia, I started a soul band. It was called the Soul Syndicate. So again, I'm pursuing this R&B that, that I learned about in Richmond, Virginia. Um, Columbia University is, was largely an all-white university. When I went, there were 16 blacks in my class of 800. There were 16 blacks in the rest of the school. So there were 32 black young men. It was an all-male school, um, Ivy League school. Um, we had, you know, less than 1% black. But I started a soul band there, and it was came quite became quite the sensation. We um, got a great following on campus. Then we also played at one of the first discotheques, uh, the Cheetah Club in Midtown Manhattan. And whenever we would play there, we would set records because the, the guys from Columbia and the other surrounding schools would come and fill the club because it was the, their local college band playing there. And so um, that was my start. I crossed over into jazz a little bit later. Um, I left Columbia in my junior year to pursue uh, the life of a musician. I moved to San Francisco uh, where I met a man whose name was Indiko Taba. He was a Zulu from South Africa and he, I played with his band for two years and he taught me all about African music. And I saw at that time how closely related um, improvisational African music was to jazz. Mm -hmm. And so the rest of my career has been this uh, blending of African music, jazz music, R&B music, and in fact, I would say black music in general, and exploring how closely related all those musics are. Mm -hmm. They all have similar patterns. They all have similar characteristics. Um, for example, 
African music and jazz music is very rhythmic. It's very polyrhythmic. Poly is a prefix that means many. It means many rhythms at once, layers of rhythm, and that's kind of inherent in black music. Uh, the music is also um, very improvisational. Um, you're improvising, you're adding new things to the music. The music is also very functional. Um, in African culture, the music is judged not by how pretty it is or how virtuosic you can play. It's based on how you affect the community, how communal it is, how you do positive things for the community. That's how we judge whether the music is good or not. And that's kind of inherent um, with the music as well. And so um, I've been exploring that relationship between R&B and uh, soul music and African music. And that's very current now because Afro Afro beats music mm -hmm. is similar, that it combines all these, crosses all these lines of different kinds of music and blending them into this sort of potpourri of, of musical influences. Right. That's what my career has been about. Okay. Um, have you had any, I guess, difficulties trying to learn that relationship, especially improvisation? Um, I know that's really hard. <laughs> well, not so much. I, I, I've had some good training in that um, because a part of improvisation of course you need some basics you need to be able to play your instrument but then it's a process of learning a kind of vernacular a kind of uh, language of improvisation depending on the genre of music so for jazz music there's a kind of a swing factor and you're learning scales and you're learning to play the upper partials of scales but in effect, you're, you're using those scales and your etudes and your exercises and then trying to make them new every day and every time you're trying to. Now, when we say improvisation, it doesn't mean that the whole thing has to be made up. Mm -hmm. Improvisation can be as simple as just adding some small, subtle parts. So when I say gospel music is improvisational or R&B music, the basic structure of the song is the same. Mm -hmm. But every time, the, uh, the really astute performer is able to make them different every night. Just some little nuance that you add on the end or some intro to the phrase. So sometimes improvisation is just a matter of making subtle changes. Um, and then when you get really good at it, you can sort of rewrite new melodies as you're going along, whole and whole, whole songs you can be improvised. Um, but I wouldn't say that it was difficult for me but then I would say after 50 years I'm still learning that process so I'm still trying to get better at it you know so I know for me because I've played piano classically and I've had that classical music foundation when I tried to I guess get into that improvisation there's like that idea that you shouldn't do that because it's it strays away from the classical music training but it's great that you're no, I think that's that's kind of a central difference between European classical orientation to music and African um, orientation to music. Because in classical music, the composer goes to great lengths to notate every note that he wants you to play, when to get faster, when to get louder, softer, when to accent certain notes. And there, when, when a composer in that tradition um, writes a song, he wants it to be played and sound the same every time it's played. If you play it 200 years from now, it would sound exactly the same. That's almost the opposite of African music. Um, in African music, the emphasis is on what's that little nuance that you did that's different, that makes it unique to this minute. And so, yes, I've played with classical players who could read the music. It could be all 32nd and 64th notes all over the page and they can sight read it immediately. But if you say, okay, we're gonna play a blues in E, they're stuck. It's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, what, what do I do? Because mm -hmm. I've been trained to interpret this music on the page. And I'm not implying that either one is better than the other. Mm -hmm. I'm simply saying they're different orientation, different aesthetic, mm -hmm. different way to judge it. But for me, um, black music, African music, this improvisational, very rhythmic, uh, music that involves the public. You know, when we go to see a classical concert, if it's a symphony, you don't even clap until after the fourth movement. Mm -hmm. In African music, 
I want you to clap from the first note if you feel it. <laughs> I want you to clap all the way through it. It's a very call and response. We're we're inter we're 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 composing this together. We're making this night and this piece of music special. So it's a different orientation, um, but I happen to like it that way. Yeah. Uh, is there a specific region um, that you get your African music influence from? Very good question. As I said, um, my first introduction to African music was. Um, with Ndiko Traba, who's a Zulu from South Africa. Mm. So that's a specific um, region and a specific kind of music. They, uh, they have different, slightly different harmonies and, and rhythms, um, a, a kind of uh, music that's endemic to theirs called Township Jive. And it's urban sounding and it's not mm. traditional African music with just drums and chants. Um, but beyond that, I have studied in West Africa, um, Ghana and Nigeria, and um, in Senegal. Those are the regions that I'm most comfortable with. Um, I also like the music from uh, the Central Africa, the Congo region. But um, Nigeria has given us a music called um, Juju music, and another music called Afro beat without the S. Afrobeat, a specific Nigerian music that kind of combines African rhythms with James Brown kind of funk. Mm. And that was created primarily by a man named Fela Kuti. Um, and um, now Afrobeats, which is the current uh, name that we mm. have for these more general um, uh, commercial African music, goes beyond Fela's funky beats to um, to add some reggae, reggae tone, Latin music, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of different polyrhythms, um, a lot of mellowness. Um, but even then, it centrally comes out of the influence of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, artists like Burna Boy, um, who is an Afrobeats right. musician who is very, very uh, popular these days. He sold out the Madison Square Garden. He was um, on the Grammys this year. He, did the whole halftime show of last year's uh, NBA uh, All-Star Game, which I point out just to say how popular African music is mm -hmm. becoming. Um, and my 40, 49 years before now, I couldn't even imagine that that would happen and be so popular in Europe and in the United States and uh, across all kinds of racial and, and, and genre lines all around the world. So. So maybe I was on to something getting involved with it all those years ago. <laughs> um, you did mention uh, how Afrobeats uh, tends to, you know, cross a lot of different kind of racial lines and uh, continental lines as well. How would you say your music has, you know, communicated with different kinds of race lines and whatnot? Um, it's, it's been an interesting journey. Um, when I started, I did a record, my first record that I recorded was a record called A Message from Mozambique. I don't know if the camera can pick this up, but this is um, an avant-garde jazz music combined with traditional African and Afro-Cuban and Afro-Brazilian rhythms. That's me right here, my face painted up there. Um, this, this was very, very hard to digest music because it was wild screaming saxophone and thunderous African drums. Um, in 1975, I released this record, and it may, this may be my most important record. It's called African Rhythms, 1975, and this was the, the record where I crossed over from avant-garde jazz to more, Af to more rhythm and blues elements. I got a little bit funky <laughs> with this record, and this record helped bridge the gap. This record became very popular over the years. When I first released it, it um, we it got played in Washington, D.C. Um, on a station called WHUR, and it was popular in Washington, D.C. 20 years later, it was picked up by a Japanese label, and then a few years after that, it was reissued in Europe. So this record is probably singularly most important for me crossing over. That deals with your question, how did it cross over genres? How did it cross over con continents? Right. Um, this record was very instrumental, a very simple song, when I, simple um, melodies with funky rhythms. When I did, my first group was called Juju, if the, when the message from Mozambique was Juju, a message from Mozambique. I moved from San Francisco to New York 
1974. Then in 1975, I came back to Richmond, which is my hometown, brought the group back to Richmond. And it may surprise you, in 1974, there was not a big marketplace for wild, screaming, avant-garde African music. And so Richmond influenced me. Um, we won, we added a female vocalist, and we added a guitar, and we added a drum set. Because before that, we were just using traditional African drums and timbales. We didn't have a drum set, no guitar, just saxophone, keyboards, xylophone, traditional instruments. So Richmond, in, in order for, remember what I said, in African music, one of the ways that we judge the music is how we affect the community. And so if I'm gonna be in a community and nobody's digging what I'm doing, that's not of any use to anybody. It's not a use to my career and it's not a use to the community. So we added these elements so that we could get our message to the people. So the message was still African rhythms, but it's now funky music. It's it, the, the, the lyrics to the song say, African rhythms make you clap your hands. African rhythms make you want to dance. And then the, the hooks, the, the bridge says, let the rhythms take you to the truth, Mother Africa. So I'm delivering a message, but now it's over a funk beat. And so that help us, helped us cross over, if you will. Um, uh, I've had really good luck, really good experiences um, with the music in other continents. Um, some would tell you that I'm more pop or ha have been more popular in Europe and in Japan than in Richmond. Um, Why do you think so? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One, as I said, Richmond, up until recently, hasn't been a very big market for African music or African-oriented music. But Europe, for example, has a different relationship to black music. Europe sees black American music, one, as being exotic because it comes from somewhere else. It's, it's, it's from a distance. So Europeans appreciate music based on a different set of aesthetics. One of the ways that they appreciate music is that they, th they admire things that last. In fact, I would say the definition of classical music is a music, something is classical when it lasts more than a generation. Mm -hmm. And so Europeans appreciate things that last. And so, if, so one of the reasons my music uh, and I sort of get over in Europe is because one, I'm dealing with a, an art form that started, if I say jazz, Europeans love jazz. They think of jazz um, as art. Whereas here, jazz was thought of as a kind of underground, it wasn't thought of as art, I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. Jazz started in places like New Orleans, and in New Orleans, back at the turn of the century, the, the, the 20th century, 1900, 1910, um, that music was found in body houses and juke joints. It was thought of as a lower class music. But Europeans didn't see it that way. They thought of it as art. They thought of that, the idea of improvisa improvisation and um, the ability to do new things with the music, um, they thought of that as high art. And so um, when I come along with this African jazz, African funk, they were open to it in a different way. They, in the United States, in the history, when, when um, the record industry was forming in the 1920s, the black music and musicians was called race music. It was, it was a kind of disparaging uh, name that said, this is not so important. This, the blues and jazz music were thought of as lower class music. But um, the Europeans heard jazz music, especially with the big bands the sw of the swing era in the 30s. Um, and even in the 20s with the New Orleans style, they would hear those instrumentalists playing and improvising, doing new things. They couldn't believe how different they made, black musicians were making the instruments sound. Mm -hmm. um, their legendary things of where uh, black bands would go to Europe and people would want to examine the instruments to see if they were the same instruments. How are you making these instruments sound so unique and so different? Mm -hmm. And so they appreciated that. And, and I'm sort of part of that tradition that in Europe, 
they see what I do, one, as being kind of exotic, two, part of a tradition, and then the fact that I have lasted 50 years, or at the time 20 years, it meant that it must mean something because else it, it wouldn't have lasted. It, mm -hmm. that, that was their attitude. So they see it as art, and they see it as kind of in its own way classical. Um, and you also mentioned Japan. What was the... The appeal there as well. and 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 I'm not sure how Japan got a hold of this music <laughs> but but I will say that in the 1970s um, jazz music was being distributed worldwide mm. not just my music but jazz in general labels like Blue Note Records um, was a very uh, renowned um, jazz label was being um, shipped and just distributed all over. Uh, in 1975, I formed uh, a record, no, let me go, 1973, I joined, released my first two albums on a label called Strata East Records. It was a, a small jazz label in New York. In fact, that's why I moved from San Francisco back to New York to be a part of that label and to work with them. And that, that was in 73. In 1975, I left Strata East and formed a, a label called Blackfire Records. Um, it's based in Washington. Uh, my co-founder was a man named Jimmy Gray. We, we were based in Washington and we distributed the, the record along the same lines as other jazz labels and s sent the records to Japan. And Japan has a, a very unique relationship to jazz music as well. And I, it suffice it to say, it's very much appreciated there. Um, so from the 1920s and 30s up through the 1990s, jazz musicians would travel to Europe and to places like Japan and be extremely well received, get red carpet treatments, treated like artists. Um, the Japanese, now I don't know enough about Japanese culture to say, why the Japanese appreciate jazz music. I just know based on statistics, based on sales, they do. And uh, um, my high school band instructor, um, Joseph, Kennedy, Joseph Kennedy, of jazz violinist, um, he would come back, he would go to Japan and play during summer break. Um, he, he had a cousin uh, um, who was a renowned um, jazz musician and they would do gigs in Japan. So I knew um, even that far back that, hey, this music can appeal across so many lines. That's great. Um, I want to go back to where you were talking about your band, Juju. Mm -hmm. um, what is your current band is uh, Plunky and the One? Oneness. Plunky and Oneness. Plunky and Oneness. Yeah. When Juju, when Remember I started in, in San Francisco, Juju, 1973, released a uh, message from Mozambique, and then uh, we had another record, Chapter 2, Nia. We came to Richmond. We changed the nature of the music when I added the drums and added the female vocalist, and we changed the name to Oneness of Juju. And so Oneness of Juju was meant to be just what we've been talking about. It was meant to say, um, it's not just jazz music and it's not just African music, but we think all of this black music is one. And so when we say plunky and oneness, we're trying to capture that essence of all those things. Now, I'm going to take two minutes or five minutes to tell you a story. When I finally got a chance to go to Africa to perform as the group Juju, a couple of things happened. I went to Nigeria, showed them the album, this, this very album that said Juju, a message from Mozambique. The people greeted me and said, like the radio DJ said, this is great, an African-American group playing juju music. Because in Nigeria, there's a specific kind of traditional music called juju music. Then they put this record on, and it's a vanguard screaming wild jazz. And they said, this isn't juju music. They were, <laughs> in, they were mad. <laughs> they said, you're just trying to export our, our name. Then I go to Ghana, the next, the next country over. I show the, I'm, I'm doing a tour there, and they... I get off the plane and I see posters that say Plunky and the oneness of God. They wouldn't say Juju on the posters or on the air because for them, in one of the tribes in Ghana, Juju is like voodoo. And they said, well, this is sacrilegious. We can't put this on the radio. But another tribe, 
they would say, I would go in other parts of Ghana, and they would say, well, what's the name of the band? I said, Wonders of Juju, and everybody would fall on the ground laughing. And I would say, why, why are you laughing? Finally, somebody told me, they said, well, in our language, Juju is the same as doo-doo. So you're saying your name is the Wonders of Shit. And so I came back and changed my name. I, said, I became Plunky and Oneness. Because every time I had been Juju, everybody, every time the person, people would ask me, what does Juju mean? What does Juju mean? And in Africa, they either laughed at me or got mad at me. And I would say, well, I don't need a name that's going to not serve me. So that's how I became Plunky and Oneness instead of Plunky and Oneness of Juju. <laughs> so long story, but that's it. That's a beautiful that's story. It. <laughs> Um, can we go back to where you were talking about um, your inspirations? You said soul, you said uh, R&B and like various. Do you, do you have any inspirations that are non-musical or anything out of Richmond? That's a good question. Um, I would say so much of who I am is based on being from and being in Richmond. Um, I don't know if this is to the point of your question, but when I go all around, I have, a, I have a manager in France, in Paris, and she would kid me and she would say, everything you say is, it's better in Richmond. It's, this is, it's not like Richmond, or Richmond this, or Richmond that. And then, and, and, and so for, in some ways, I'm like an ambassador. I'm taking what I think of as Richmond culture with me wherever I go. Remember when I said I started a band at Columbia University and it was called Soul Syndicate? Really, all I was doing was imitating the R&B bands that were in Richmond because they didn't have that in New York. So I've been carrying Richmond, whether it's music or not, with me wherever I go. Um, but also, I'd like to think that I'm bringing back what I go and experience in other places, whether it be meeting a man in Deco from South Africa and learning about his culture and bringing that back, or getting to go to Europe and, and being able to talk about classical music in a different way than I would have otherwise. Um, Richmond has given me um, the, the attitude of a sleepy little town, but also a kind of a vibrant city. I, I really love Richmond. Um, I'm prejudiced because this is where I was raised, and this is my mother and father and my house. And when I went to Columbia and left Richmond, I came back because when I came back to visit, I lived in the Bird across the street from Bird Park, and this was a strange thing. It was the exact same trees were still there, and I said, "This is what it means to have roots in a place." Mm -hmm. Not that it's like the trees. They were the exact same trees. I mean, they had just grown bigger and fatter and <laughs> taller, but they were the same trees. Um, so I have this orientation to life that comes from Richmond and not just from the music, but the idea of the small town, but also the vibrant city. Now, not everything about Richmond is necessarily positive, particularly if you look at its history. It was the capital of the Confederacy. It was the second largest slave trading post in, in the country. It was uh, a place of segregation. I, I, when I lived here, when I grew up here, it was total segregation. I went to an all black schools all my life. I went to Maggie Walker High School, all black school. Um, when I was growing up in Richmond, I may have known only two or three white people by name. Um, and one of them was a Russian man, Mr. Tears, Gospodine Tears, who taught me Russian in the, in the 12th grade. Um, there was little or no fraternizing between the races. We were taught not to look at white people in the face. We couldn't sit at the lunch counters downtown. You, there was a lot to not like about Richmond. But the people in general are people. Um, the people in Richmond know the life that they know because it's the life that they live. And in some ways, I find it hard to hold against them what they have, what they don't know, or what they didn't know at the time. Now, Richmond is a lot different now. Richmond is uh, one of the fastest growing places. We have people moving here from all up and down the East Coast. Uh, it's a 
kind of a, thought of as a nice place to live. It has four distinct seasons, none of them too harsh. Uh, has a very vibrant art scene. Um, I've been a part of the arts in Richmond and the education in Richmond since my return. Um, I taught in public schools, mainly as a long-term substitute teacher. I taught the marching band at John F. Kennedy High School, out of which it was a very small band. Several, some of, several of my musicians went on to be, be professional musicians. Um, James Gates, who is a saxophonist from here, um, he still performs here. He directs the, the jazz program at Virginia State University. He was in that band. Um, uh, a guitarist, Anthony Ingram, who went on to play R&B from here. Um, uh, Drummy Zeb, whose name was Ernest Williams, uh, went on to play with the Whalers, Bob Molly's band, for 15 years from Richmond. Um, Ross Mel Glover, who's a guitarist, who was the guitarist that I said we added to become Oneness of Juju, Ross Mel Glover played with that same um, uh, Bob Marley and the Whalers band. Um, um, uh, another guy, Kenny Christian, went on to play in New York, play bass with Melba Moore and a number of other R&B fans. So that says to me that one, I've had some small bit of influence um, those musicians tell me it wasn't so much the, the music that I taught them, but by demonstrating I had these records and they looked up to the fact that I had released these albums and that I was traveling all over. And so they were inspired by that. And so one of my, you asked me about Richmond's influence on me, but I'm really talking about my influence on Richmond, um, that I've gone to these other places and brought through some personal acclaim, brought some of that shine back to Richmond and so and in Washington um, I've had a really great experience I'm jumping around but I've had a really great experience my label Black Fire was based in Washington and I would travel to Washington every week and so I was in Washington so much people thought I lived there um, in 1975 1976 77 78 um, I became a part of a, a collective in DC we have released See, our label released not just my music, but several other. And one of my claims to fame is the group EU, the go-go band, that comes from the group called Experience Unlimited. And on Black Fire Records, we released their first album. And we were a part of a group called Charisma Production, which was a booking agency. And they booked acts like Gil Scott Heron, Lionel Liston Smith, um, uh, uh, Norman Connors, Roy Ayers, Chuck Brown, um, and a number of others, and my band, Wonders of Juju, would open for, for a lot of those acts, and, and we feel like we influenced the creation of Go-Go, because we were the ones bringing this African percussion, and we started the, the idea of non-stop, of keeping the rhythms going for the whole set, like they do in Go-Go music. We did it because People didn't like our music all that much or weren't so familiar with it. So once we got them going, we wouldn't stop because we wouldn't want to have to start over again. So we just played the whole time. And now that's a part of the go-go scene. And, and the African percussionist that we used, uh, one of whom was named Asante, who had come here with Hugh Masakila. And Masakila was booked by Charisma Production. And when, when, that, when it was time for them to go back, Asante stayed and he played with our band. And that's uh, uh, his percussion was a part of what they were imitating to be go-go music. So a lot of this 50-year history intertwines of a lot of different directions and, a, and from a lot of different directions. You asked me about um, traveling to Europe. I, I've had several experiences in Europe, not the least of which was one without my band. I performed, I toured for six weeks with a man named Bobby, Bobby Bird. Bobby Bird was the sidekick of James Brown. Um, and the song, get on up, and he said, get up, uh, get on up. Well, that was Bobby Bird answering. Bobby Bird was kind of the person who discovered James Brown early on, and then James Brown took it over. But um, I toured with Bobby Bird, and that was quite an experience. We toured in Switzerland, Germany, France, and all over Europe on a tour bus. That was a great experience for me. Um, I have interacted with a number of musicians through my career who are either famous themselves or alongside famous musicians. Like Bobby Bird, it's a little less famous than James Brown, but James Brown is world-renowned as 
godfather of funk and soul. Um, I, one of my idols with the saxophone is John Coltrane, a name you might know or not, may not know, a very um, a jazz saxophonist who is responsible for sort of creating uh, cosmic jazz or um, this very creative avant-garde jazz. And his sidekick was a man named Pharaoh Sanders, and Pharaoh Sanders um, gave me a gig uh, on an album with him, and I looked up to Pharaoh. Uh, so those are exa I, I met a man named um, uh, Rasan Roland Kirk, who was renowned for playing two or three saxophones at the same time. And he was blind, and he could circular breathe and keep the um, the notes going endlessly. Three saxophones at once. Well, I met him, and he taught me how to circular breathe. Um, I have all these experiences intersecting with musicians from around the world, and I think of myself sort of like a black forest gump. You know, I just happen to fall into those situations that I was able to benefit from. It's not like I went out to say, I'm gonna meet this guy in Deco. I just, somebody introduced me and we hit it off for two years. Um, a man, Ornette Coleman, is a renowned avant-garde saxophonist. I met him and two weeks later, he turned over, he had an art gallery in New York. He turned over his art, he was going to, to North Africa for six weeks. He said, Plunky, I want you to take care of my place and run my art gallery and do the booking and all that. I had known him two weeks. I mean, how can you plan for something like that? I, I, he either was crazy or he just had great faith that I was a good person. Um, so I've had all kinds of experiences. I'm hoping some of those will spark any other questions that you might have. <laughs> Going back to what we were talking about, about just your influence on the community, and I would say that VCU has changed a lot, and the Richmond community in general. How have you contributed to VCU specifically? Because I feel like I love VCU just because it is very diverse, and the youth culture is is great, and I feel like it's very different from what you grew up in. Yeah, um, VCU is near and dear to my heart. Near because I live near. <laughs> Um, I had the great experience of teaching there for a year. Um, I took over for um, Dr. Odell Hobbs, who was a, uh, he taught a class, I think it was on African, African American history, or music history. But in any case, he went on sabbatical f for a year in Israel, and he asked me to take over his class. He was the music director at Virginia Union. And I took over that position, but as a adjunct factory, fac, faculty to VCU. So I taught at VCU, so I had that experience. VCU also is near and dear to me because we haven't talked about it, and I don't know how much time we have, but, but I was also a part of the arts administration world in Richmond. Mm -hmm. we, we, should, we should talk about that a little bit, but how that relates to... Well, let me say... Um, I. I formed a, an organization called Branches of the Arts. It was a nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. It functioned like an arts council. Before forming that group, I, I was trying to get grants to do my art. I found that you couldn't get grants from a non, as a, unless you had a nonprofit corporation. So I was writing grants to the Virginia Commission for the Arts and other agencies and foundations. I had to be a nonprofit. And all the other, most of the other black groups in town did not have a nonprofit corporation, so they couldn't get grants. So I formed a nonprofit corporation. Still ran into problems getting grants, and so we got an attorney and threatened to sue the Virginia Commission for the Arts under the theory that black people pay taxes and this is tax money that's going out to these arts organizations like the Richmond Symphony or the Virginia Commission for the, I mean, Virginia Museum or the Valentine Museum or the Richmond Ballet. They were getting these monies that were tax monies. And so we made the case that black groups should get some of those mm -hmm. funds. I won't go into all the legal battle of it, but we were able to, out of that set of struggles, we, there was an organization in town called the Federated Arts Council. It was like a council of all the arts groups, but there were no black groups in that. And so, because we raised all this fuss, we threatened the funding for the whole state system of arts distribution, so they sort of had to bring us in. And so, the Federated Arts Council brought me in as the program director. 
and my organization, Branches of the Arts, functioned like a small arts council. We got theater groups, church choirs, we formed the Richmond Jazz Society, all as a part of this group, of, uh, this umbrella group, Branches of the Arts. All, I say all this to, for a reason. We also formed the first black arts gallery in the state, in, in a house up on Church Hill. 3310 East Broad Street, it was called Kahiro Galleries, the, the Juju Raga Artist House. Um, so the first major art exhibit we had was by a man named Murray De Pillars. Murray De Pillars, you should know his name yeah. because now he's, his name is on a building mm -hmm. on Broad Street. Uh, he became the, the dean of the School of the Arts. But his first art exhibit when he came from, he was from Chicago, when he came in, was at our art gallery. He wanted to support the black arts community in the community. So as that town gown situation, he, he knew the value of not just VCU being closed to VCU, but having outreach into the community. So Dean DePillars, or Dr. DePillars, exhibited at our arts gallery, and he was a jazz lover. And so the Richmond Jazz Society, which was formed in my dining room, <laughs> um, uh, reached out to Dean DePillars, and he partnered with Branches of the Arts and the Jazz Society to create a jazz program at VCU. Mm -hmm. And we did a couple of years of series. We brought renowned jazz uh, artists, and we put them at, at the Grove Street Baptist Church Auditorium. I think that's still where the music department, part of the music department is based. We would do things in what was their chapel part. Mm -hmm. We brought Hugh Masekiller, we brought Pharaoh Sanders, we brought um, uh, um, uh, Art Blakey. We brought all these renowned jazz musicians to VCU. And eventually, Dean DePillars out of the School of the Arts created the jazz program to have a jazz degree. and. Um, they formed a, a student uh, and a, a student jazz ensemble, a big band. Um, so that makes me close to VCU. It's a long story, but that makes me close to, to VCU. Then there's another story. The VCU Jazz Department did an exchange program with South Africa. Now you must sense some full circle coming. Um, when they go to South Africa, they meet Indiko Ngaba's wife. Deco has died by this time, but he, they meet his wife, and she says, well, you're from Richmond, you must know Plunky. And they did not know me. <laughs> they come back and, and meet me, and they have me do a, a performance with this um, exchange student ensemble. We even record an album that I'm on from VCU's music jazz department, and um, and and the, the director of the ensemble said, it's so wild, we, we had to go 5,000 miles to meet somebody who was based five minutes away from campus. Right. <laughs> um, but that's full circle. Yeah. Me meeting Indico in San Francisco, and then meeting his wife in South Africa, and that was an introduction for me to interact once again with the VCU. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of VCU for all of those reasons. I, I love the diversity of it. Um, I love the diversity of its student body, its faculty. I love its attention to the arts. I don't know its science department. I don't know its, its medical. Now, I do know something about its medical school. Um, uh, my brother, who plays bass with me for 18 years, directed the arts program at VCU MCV. He coordinated put, putting the arts all around all the hospital buildings, of which there are nine all around the state now mm -hmm. from VCU. He's the person that bought and put up the art and would do arts programs and have music performances at, at the, the college. So that's another connection with me, my family, and VCU. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I'm just really proud, really, of all the universities uh, in this area. Virginia Union, because I directed their, their jazz studies and created an African art um, music, um, gallery on their campus, Virginia State, because I've done a number of things there. Not so much the University of Richmond, but um, for me, um, uh, VCU is, is like the crown jewel of that community here. That's great. <laughs> now, on your notes, you, you mentioned from my 
bio, um, I want to talk a little bit about one of the things I'm most proud of in my career, and that is I got an award. I was nominated or named a part of 50 for 50. It's um, created by the Virginia Commission for the Arts, and this was naming the um, 50 most important people in the arts for the state of Virginia for the last 50 years. And I was named one of those people. Um, there were only eight musicians in that, out of that 50. And so I feel quite honored that after I almost sued them in 1978 <laughs> and, and the problems that I may have caused for them, but I have been funded by them and toured under their auspices for the last 20, 25 years. Um, I've done a number of things in this community that speak to longevity. Mm -hmm. For example, there is um, some, uh, a festival of arts that happens every year in Bird Park at Dogwood Dell. Um, I've played on that for 42 years straight. Mm -hmm. And once again, in 78, I was one of the first black artists to perform at that venue. Um, when the first time that I performed, first two years, they didn't even put me on the main stage, they put me off to the side. It was, again, I'm talking about a very segregated place. Um, but I've gone on to play there 42 years in a row. Um, perseverance, if, if I were advising, and you haven't asked me this, but if I were advising young people in the arts, whether it be fashion or marketing or whatever, I would say, I would have several recommendations. First and foremost, I would say take care of yourself. I would say eat right, get plenty of rest, um, take care of your body and your mind. I would also say um, um, be prepared for the long haul. Um, be prepared for... When I started being a musician and releasing a record, really I didn't see too much further past my nose. I thought I'm going to release a record and it's going to be a hit and I'm going to be a star mm -hmm. next week. That was kind of my attitude. Even if that had been true, I wouldn't have been able to get out of my quote unquote career anything if I hadn't been prepared to go further than that, longer than that. We've heard of the concept of the one hit wonder. You can have a hit record make a lot of money and get famous, but if you don't have a plan for going the long term, it can disappear. And especially in today's world where things can go viral in an instant and be gone in two months. Um, so I would advise young people to, to take the long view. I would say, understand that your career is just that. A career implies a kind of a longevity. Um, and that means you have to plan for it. And that, but part and parcel of that is building enough skills that you can be diversified in what you're able to do. Um, this is probably old hat by now, but I used to advise people, young people, get experience with video, with doing video. It's old hat now, but 10 or 15 years ago, it wasn't so old that no matter what field you go in, and, and I would be a genius of predicting because it has come to pass that just about everything we do now is on screens. Right. Every connection we have is with a screen of one size or another, and that's visuals. And so if you can manipulate visuals, and most people can now, most young people, especially you're always online and you're doing things, you now you edit video. But that's a tremendous skill to have because that's how we communicate. So building your skills in that way, diversifying your art, and then I would say learn business, learn business techniques, learn, learn financial management, um, because no matter what field you go in, it's going to interface with the business community, the business delivery system. Marketing in general is just so important. And I could probably name other things, but I'll give you a chance to ask questions in case I'm just touching on things and not getting to things that you might have wanted to ask me about. I kind of wanted you to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I, the other thing that we would touch on or I would touch on um, 
for, for the community that would see this is that um, I would hope that my life would be in some ways inspirational. Not so much because of what I've accomplished, and I think I have accomplished quite a bit, but it depends on what yardstick. I mean, I've written 478 songs. Sounds like a lot. But Stevie Wonder probably wrote that many in three or four months or something. You know, <laughs> uh, you know it's uh, 500 songs in 50 years is only 10 songs a year. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like a lot, but not so much. Um, but I have accomplished a lot. I've written a book. I've, I've written a, my memoir, which is 450 pages. It's a big wow. book. I've written a book of poetry. I've released 27 albums. Um, I've gone to Africa. 11 times toured in Europe three or four times been to Brazil for carnival been to Cuba twice done three documentary films done a lot mm -hmm. but what I want to share is the, the fact of not giving up in a word the idea of perseverance the idea of keeping going um, now what it takes to keep going is where I started uh, taking care of yourself because you can't keep going if your body falls apart if you lose your mind if you're if you're drugged out you can't keep going for 50 years so that's part of it on the other end of the spectrum if you were going to be like Plunkett you'd have to be very lucky you'd have to you'd have to you'd be lucky enough to meet Indico Naba or lucky enough to go to Pharaoh Sanders concerts every day for 10 days, never moving from start to finish, and him just then running into him a week later in Detroit and a week after that in, in New York, and him thinking you're following him around, and, and then him being enamored enough to say, come on, I'll, I'll let you record with me. And that's kind of luck. A um, Couple of other things, and I hope you can edit this down because I talk a lot. <laughs> Other thing I want to talk about, not only is my longevity, but how this dovetails. I talked about African Rhythms, this album, 1975, then 1990 something, it being reissued in Japan. Then in the 2000s, it's being re in, re, um, reissued by a label in London called Strut Records that bought my whole Blackfire catalog and is reissuing the whole thing of it. My music has been oftentimes before it's time. We had a record in 1980, 81 called Every Way But Loose. It was a dance record. It was like a, almost a disco record. And here's the luck again. A man named um, Larry Levan, who was a famous DJ, you probably never heard him, but he was a famous DJ. He played a, at a place in New York called the Paradise Garage. It was very important in the, 1980s, in the disco era. He played that record and it became a hit. And then um, Every Way But Loose became a hit. And then um, Sutra Records, which is part of Buddha Records, which no longer exists, bought the record from me. They reissued it in London. It became a top 10 dance hit in London. But that's kind of luck. That's kind of lucky. I didn't know Larry Levan for him to pick it up and play it and then for people in New York to hear it and Detroit and in DC to hear it. That's perseverance because I'm still at it. I'm mm -hmm. still going. But what, I'm, what I wanted to say was the reason why I think keeping going and some sort of longevity is important because by my example, you can be ahead of your time. And 20 years later, somebody discovered this record, African Rhythms, in 2000 or 1999, was discovered by a man whose name was Jay Dilla. Jay Dilla was a producer from Detroit, very famous, legendary producer, hip hop producer. He discovered this record and re recorded it on his album called well Welcome to Detroit gave me credit and everything. James Branch, you'll see it on the thing. But when I, somebody came to me and said, Plunk, I heard your, somebody sampled your record. Um, so I hunted them down. Turns out he didn't sample my record. He re-recorded it from scratch. He 
reduplicated the bass line. Even my opening monologue, I said, these are African rhythms passed down to us from the ancient spirit. Feel the spirit, a unifying force. Stand up, clap your... They did the whole thing, had a rapper say the same thing I had then dipped in the whole song. Okay, that's 1999. I was going to sue them because they didn't pay me. Then I said, you know, it's just some young guys from Detroit. It's not going to amount to anything. Turns out he dies early before his time. He's famous. Now, fast forward again. Now, 2015, a man named J. Cole samples the J. Dilla version of my song, and it's on the, the, J. Cole, the J. Cole album. Let me embarrass myself. I didn't even know who J. Cole was. <laughs> but now just fast forward to put an end on that story. I've made more money on the sample, the 15% of the writer's part that from J. Cole than all the rest of the, for this album, for the whole 50 years it's been around. The, the one little sample. Now also, don't tell J. Cole, don't listen to this part. I can't even hear my sample in his version, but they pay me for it. So, But that's, that's perseverance, because I'm still around that many years so I could get paid for this. And it's the luck. How can right. you plan for that, you know? Yeah. I could be soliciting J. Cole, please sample my record. Who would know? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, how would I get to it? Um, another story, because I'm trying to make, the, are we out of time? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, again, this is kind of a full circle. And remember I told you, Black Fire Records, 1975, we started. One of our first albums that we re recorded was by a group called Experience Unlimited, now known as EU, the go-go band from DC. In 2022, I guess this was, 2021, 2022, a piece of one of their records, though, on our Blackfire label, mm -hmm. is used in a ad for New Balance sneakers. It's, you, if you watch sports, particularly NFL or NBA, you've probably heard one of their ads. They have several, maybe 10 or 15 different ads. One with Kawhi Leonard, one with uh, Coco Gaw, um, one with a rapper, one with a Korean pop, K-pop group, mm -hmm. where the song says, uh, hey you, can you come together? Well, that's from my catalog, from, um, from Blackfire, from my publishing company, and it made a heck of a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Again, luck, perseverance is, because I'm still marketing, still promoting my stuff after all these years, and it catches. Um, last thing maybe, and then we'll do follow up if you have any other questions. Um, one of the things I think we wanted to talk about is what am I doing now? Right. What does my future look like? Well, let me say, I'm 76 years old. I'm not sure how long a future I have, but I'm still very, very active. I have a new album called Love Is Everywhere. It's a brand new CD, just came out the first of this month. Um, I am doing a compilation of my love songs from my catalog. It's gonna, it's gonna be 25 love songs from all my catalog. Then I'm doing a compilation of 30 Afro Beats songs because, see, I was into Afro Beats before it was called Afro Beats. Mm -hmm. I was into Afrofuturism before they even had that name for it. I'm in the Smithsonian uh, Institute um, documentary on Afrofuturism. Um, so I'm doing my 30 Afro Beats songs on a compilation. Then I'm going to do a compilation of 50 songs of funk and, and instrument, jazz funk and jazz soul music. Why? Because I'm trying to pitch all these musics now for what we call sync, synchronizations, where you put this music in commercials, TV shows, and movies. Um, because I have some experience with this now, I'm, I have a documentary on um, Blackfire, uh, the label, which is on PBS nationally, and 
I am, lastly but not least, I'm writing a, a, a movie script about, it's called Going to Africa. It's about hip hop going to Africa. It's like a, about a hip hop artist who um, goes to Africa thinking that he and his group are gonna find paradise and be like Eddie Murphy's thing, but they get, end up getting stranded there and having to adjust to living in the third world mm -hmm. um, and finding their true purpose. So I'll be doing that and I still perform every once in a while too. So. You really do serve as an inspiration. It's really great. I, I love being able to find, like if I listen to a song now, a pop song, and then I peel back the layers and I find the sample that samples a sample, and then I find the original artist, it's just, it's just like history. And yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. really great. That's great. <laughs> that's absolutely great. Yeah, one, one last question. Um, you did, you talked about you know, your influence uh, in VCU and on GoGo -Go Music and in various places. What would you say, like, would you say that's a part of your legacy now? Like I you? think, yes. I think absolutely. Um, and that's such a great thing, Zoo. I'm glad you gave me a chance to talk about that. Um, because at 76, I'll be 77 in July. At this age, legacy becomes a part of my focus um, at this age and I pray that you'll be 76 one day I say that a hundred times a week everybody I mean I say, oh, you'll be 76 one day if you see why I'm walking like this or I'm doing um, playing tennis so slowly but um, <laughs> but at 76 legacy becomes a real big part of my thought process what am I leaving behind um, what's my reputation um, and it comes down to this. I'm not sure I can articulate this. I, I think about it a lot, but I don't have it in words, so you have to bear with me. Um, but it comes down to, one, I'm going to die. We all are going to die. You don't have to think of that yet because you're not 70, but we're going to die. And then it becomes a process, for the first time in my life, it becomes a process of, now, what is the benefit of me having lived? What, what? That's a whole different way to think about it. I, I doubt that you would have thought of it that way because I just got to this within the last few months. Now that I've gotten this far, what will it mean that I've ever lived? What am I leaving behind? And why is that even important? Um, so for me, yes, what I've accomplished becomes a part of my legacy, but even all of what I think I've done, all of that, is only as important as it leaves a positive impression on somebody else. I can list my accomplishments, my discography, all the songs, all the books, the films, but what does it matter, at least for my, in my philosophy, what does it matter unless I've positively affected somebody else? That's gonna be here after me I'm not somebody who believes in reincarnation doesn't mean that it's not real but it's not I don't spend my time thinking of how I'm going to come back and I don't likewise think of my time spend my time thinking about my afterlife what I do think about is what I'm going to leave here physically my children my family my son plays with me my daughter is a a accomplished businesswoman. My son-in-law is a renowned DJ, did remix for Aaliyah, blah, blah, blah. I have all these, but what am I leaving my grandkids? What, am, what are they gonna be able to say about me? And even if it's not about a personal aggrandizement, it's not about me getting something, so oh, Plunky did this, but what positive thing, take me out of it, what positive thing am I leaving that will help keep this idea of humans going. For me, a part of my philosophy these days is this concept of connections and webbing. And for me, the people who listen to my music and the people who come see me and the people who see my films and the people I've interacted with across the globe are a microscopic part of the eight billion people are here just such a small person oh it's just a few people it might be a couple of thousand it might be ten thousand at most that's 
microscopic amount of eight billion. Mm -hmm. These connections that we make, those groupings are how we influence the planet. Sometimes we vote, sometimes we form a gang, sometimes we form a company, sometimes we um, form alliances. We might uh, join with other com countries. So no matter how big or small, it's all about little groupings, these connections. And those connections are only important to the degree that we can influence the planet positively. That's my spiel. It's like what you said about um, African music and how they perceive a good song versus, mm -hmm. I guess, a bad song. Mm -hmm. It's about the what, the what it brings effect. to the community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I learned 50 years ago. <laughs> I'm still That's chasing it. it, still trying to promote that mm -hmm. as a philosophy. I really do think it is possible for all of us across racial lines and even across national and international barriers. It is possible, it is conceivable that we could live here peacefully and manage a system of delivery of everything that we need in ways that's fair and just. Fair that everybody gets something. I don't say it's equal, but everybody gets what they deserve. And just meaning that we balance inconsistencies and injustices that have ha happened in the past. There ought to be a way we could do that. There ought to be a way that I, I yell and preach to my brother all the time. Who could be bombing someplace in Gaza? Or how could we afford to be bombing Ukraine? We should be building stuff. We can't be bombing. It's too hard to support eight and a half billion people. We shouldn't be knocking stuff down. We should be figuring out ways to, but I, I preach, sorry. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Um, do you have anything else to say? Uh, just thank you so much. I learned so much about you. And just as a former musician, it's really great to be able to see what you did and your contribution to the community as well. My pleasure, thank yeah. you. Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, Socials. I just this was a really beautiful conversation. It was very insightful. I mean, I have a lot of things that I'm going to walk away, for, you know, walk away with. Um, I just wanted to thank you for coming here. Thank you. And uh, is there a way that we can uh, find you on social media? Thank you for asking. Yes. Um, website www.plunky1.com. P L U N E O N E. P L U N K Y O N E. Plunky1.com. And if you Google Plunky. There are about 25,000 references on Google that you come up with that word. About 20,000 of them are me in one way or another. <laughs> so it's not many Plunkies on the planet. So if you Google Plunky, if you forget anything, just put in Plunky on any search engine you find me. Whether it's uh, any of the Apple Music or Spotify, any of those things, or just Googles in general. I have um, YouTube channels with 40 or 50 videos. I'm constantly doing stuff. So. You'll find me if you're looking for me. <laughs> Thank you again. Yeah.